Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second day of Balcon 2K16. Hope you're getting, having a great time. Uh, today's lectures, uh, this one will be about IT of another Europe. So our speaker will be Arjen. Uh, Arjen worked at IBM in the 90s as an IT architect. Since 2002 until 2010, uh, he was uh, consulting with uh, several uh, European countries about their IT uh, strategy. And since 2006, he helps uh, secure informational systems of uh, national governments and NGOs. So please give a warm welcome to Arjen. Enjoy. Good afternoon, all. It's only 2.30 in the afternoon. Everybody's already awake, so that's very cool. Thank you for being here. And thank you to Balkan for inviting me. I've never been to Serbia before. So uh, up to now, it's really uh, been, uh, been great. I want to talk about for, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, I hope, um, about some of the work I've been doing on the relationship between uh, IT strategy, which is something I've been working on for the last 15 years, and uh, IT security, which after Snowden, of course, turns out to be a lot harder than we all feared it would. Um, and recently, I found a fairly large corporation where I can actually say a lot of this stuff out loud and not, you know, get moved out of the door very quickly. Uh, so that's been very cool. Um, so most of the slides you're about to see and most of the things I will say, I've actually been uh, talking to uh, the chief information officers and the chief security people of very large European technology companies as well. And they are looking for experts to basically help them with uh, some of this stuff. So I'll be talking about that as well. I'm not going to do the basics of IT security because I know that most people here probably already have know how to encrypt their email and things like that. Um, but if you have questions about that or if you're into journalism and you want to talk to me about things like that, then after the talk, come up to me and we can have a discussion. So some of you may be old enough to remember a time when you could get on an airplane without being treated like a criminal for 45 minutes. I can certainly remember the glory days of the 1990s when you could get on an airplane with two titanium ice axes and legally they would be walking sticks, so that would be fine. Um, nowadays, of course, you have to surrender your toenail clippers even if you are the pilot because of security or something. Um, so the world has gone a little bit funny over the 15 years and hopefully at some point in the future we can roll it back to something resembling normalcy. Um, I certainly would like to work, uh, to work on that. And in the meantime, of course, we should all be legally allowed to encrypt our emails and not be considered a terrorist when we do so. So all the cybers have been, of course, in the news a lot, usually with images like these, because, you know, those evil cyber people doing cyber things to our cyber systems, yadi, yadi, yadi. Um, so I try to avoid those kinds of words whenever possible, but sometimes if you want to talk to a minister, you have to use the C word, because otherwise they don't understand. Um, so then you just sort of relent a little bit. The problem is, of course, with most of the news about all the IT security problems and privacy breaches and intrusions into systems, nobody talks about, you know, the elephant in the room in corporate world. Um, and, of course, we know, certainly thanks to Snowden, but we knew before that, yeah, everybody is spying and they're using information technology to do so. So, in 2000, we had a, a report to the European Parliament about especially American digitized uh, uh, espionage against European countries, European political institutions, and European corporations. Um, and a July 2001 report actually detailed a lot of uh, effective countermeasures against that kind of industrial and political espionage done by even then the NSA. They called it Echelon then, we call it different now, but it's the same stuff. Um, and it said, look, teach all the young people in school how to do email encryption, use only open source encryption libraries. And, you know, it said all those really sensible good things that are still really sensible advice. And that was in 2001. Regrettably, it was in July 2001 uh, that the report was offered to the European Parliament. Then, of course, in August, everybody on one was on holiday, and they were going to discuss the report in September of 2001. But then something else happened, and of course, then we were suddenly at war with Afghanistan for reasons that still are a bit unclear, but there we were. And so the report sort of disappeared into a deep drawer and was never seen again until Mr. Snowden got on a plane to Hong Kong with a USB drive containing about a million very interesting documents that most of you will have seen by now. So some European parliaments, including the Dutch one that I worked with for, for several years, have tried to 
implement as policy some of these measures that you know democratic government should be running mostly on open source software because if law is executed by code then that code should be public just like the law it's not very difficult to understand if you understand a little bit about democracy um, but that has been blocked by massive lobbying and of course since Snowden we now probably know why America is so against European governments running on something else than uh, American made software so currently our governments are mostly incompetent i don't think that most of them are completely evil but there's a lot of incompetence there and yeah there are some really bad people also into western european governments who are who seem to be bent on making us into very nasty countries so um i uh, i've been living in germany for um mostly uh, for a while and of course in germany the whole mass spying thing was kind of a big thing because uh, the German people, they have some experience, of course, with what happens to your country when your government goes really, really bad, and they have still a memory of that. And so two weeks after um, Snowden got on the plane to Hong Kong and started talking to press people, uh, Obama had a visit to Berlin, because that's the kind of thing you do as an American president when you want to get reelected. You go to Berlin, you stand in front of the Brandenburger Tor, you pretend to be John F. Kennedy, and you say things like, you know, la, la, la. Of course, the previous time when um, Obama went to Berlin, uh, his, his, he wasn't elected then yet. That was before he became president. But he had one thing going for him, that he wasn't George Bush. So all the Germans loved him for that. And then, of course, the next time he came, just after Snowden, they didn't love him that much anymore. So very few people actually came to his uh, Brandenburger tour. So then, of course, the news starts you know, um, coming out. So a former a top guy from the German um, uh, security service who no longer works there because you know, he was old enough to leave quietly said, yeah, 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 no, look, all this spying we're doing, it's not about terrorism, it's about economic espionage. And, and sometimes we are sort of forced by the NSA to help them to spy against European companies for American companies, right? So, so the NSA helps Boeing steal the secrets of Airbus. And this is hurting the European economy. And it, we're talking about something like 250 billion euros a year, 60 billion alone just for Germany. And so it's, it, we're talking about numbers of jobs, economic growth, um, you know, important stuff for us. And it's, but it's not just against bigger companies. It's also against smaller companies. It's everybody is a target. So even if you're a, a bunch of French agricultural companies, you may actually be a target of industrial espionage which is enabled by you know military grade technologies executed by military spy organizations like the nsa uh, so all of this is controversial even though the documentary proof has been online now for a couple of years because of course the political implications of it are so very very painful to many european governments so aside from stealing from our companies to the tune of hundreds of billions probably at least as much as Chinese, probably more, we really don't know. Um, Americans also use their intelligence position, which is probably better than everybody else, except when it comes to terrorism. There they always miss the thing. Uh, but f with everything else, they have a really good track record now. And so they use that to manipulate political processes, like the 2009 Copenhagen Conference on Climate Change, which, as you may remember, completely fell apart into pieces. Now fast forward to 2015, where everybody is now aware of the fact that this is happening, and many of the people who went to Paris to talk about the climate again took measures to not be spied on by the NSA. And you might have noticed that the result of that conference was slightly different than the one in Copenhagen, and so it helps to push back, even with very low-tech means, such as not carrying your phone with you when you're having a sensitive conversation. So it is a beautiful picture. This building actually exists. Um, within the NSA, it's not as Big Jim as Big Jim and the Twins, um, and uh, it used to be an NSA listening post uh, just on the edge of Berlin when the Cold War was still a thing. And so, one of the things that the NSA apparently has been doing is to monitor all our porn surfing habits, just on the off chance that you might ever become a successful journalist, activist, politician, or whatever. And then they have this nice little dossier on you of you know to pressure you in if you if you don't play ball enough. Um, so this is nothing to do with fighting terrorism. In fact, the NSA has never caught a terrorist in the last 15 years, despite spending you know, a considerable amount of money, e.g. more money than most countries have, on supposedly fighting terrorism. But their success rate right now is limited to a single cab driver from San Diego transferring $8,000 to a nonprofit organization in Somalia. 
uh, who might have used some of those dollars for something that we don't know. That, that's the full extent of the success of the NSA counter-terrorism um, counter effort. Um, and of course, they've been listening to dangerous terrorists like Angela Merkel, Doctors Without Borders, Amnesty International, the list goes on. So of course, maybe not the people in this room, but many of our fellow citizens are still very happily using the Facebooks, the LinkedIns, the Twitters, and all those other things that, yes, it can be convenient, and you know, it might even get you laid, but it also spies on you, right? So yeah, Facebook is free, but of course it's not free. You're paying, and not just with your privacy, you're paying with the privacy for everybody around you, and it's a real problem. So it's like the little piggies in the barn. You know, they get free housing, free food, and all the antibiotics they can eat. And so maybe for the more naive pigs among them, it might seem like a really good deal until, of course, the big steel truck shows up and then the deal is not so good because you get taken away. Um, so yeah, if it's, if it's free and if it's not an open source kind of thing, and you're not the customer, you're the product, right? You're not Facebook's customer, you're Facebook's product. It's your identity and knowledge and connections that are being sold. Same with Google and LinkedIn and Twitter and all those kinds of companies. And generally the same with cloud computing stuff. This is an actual screenshot from a weather radar. So I'm not a religious person, but I almost believe that somebody doesn't like Dutchland very much, um, which is where I'm from. Uh, but as the Free Software Foundation said, and it's a really good summary of what is known as cloud computing, there is no cloud, there's just other people's computers. And if your stuff is important and it's on somebody else's computer and you don't have the root password, then maybe you're doing something wrong. And this goes for individuals, but it certainly goes for countries and medical institutions and political parties and you know important stuff. So a lot of um, sort of suspicious people like me and others already suspected of course that US dominance in the IT world globally would be used for espionage. But now of course we have the NSA internal slides telling us so, so that really makes the discussion a lot easier because it's no longer a debate. The only debate is are we gonna do something about it or are we just gonna surrender? So these are just some of the companies whose products are fully backdoored when you buy them. And whether you as a consumer or you as a national government, doesn't matter. We cannot trust this stuff, which is a real problem because the entire Western world runs on it. And, and the more modern your country is, the more of this stuff you have. And if we want to be democratic sovereign nations that are under control of our stuff, all of this needs to be replaced. All of it. Which is not easy because there's no replacement for many of these things right now, so we're gonna have to make those. But you know, hey, we're Europe. We are 500 million fairly highly educated smart people. We're the largest economic bloc on the planet. So why couldn't we make the alternatives for this? Oh, by the way, buying all this crap every year is costing us another 250 billion euros a year. So I'm thinking that's a lot of jobs. And I'm hearing that in some countries people could use a couple of jobs, so maybe that's a good idea. So I'm now actually getting a bunch of very large European companies to say, that's not totally crazy. So slowly we're moving ahead. So it's not just software, it's not just you know the back doors and Windows and Macs and iOS and Android phones and all that stuff. It goes all the down, you know, it goes down to the hardware. Every Intel chipset post 2009 is backdoored when you get it. And there is very little to nothing you can do about it. Now that doesn't mean that you know the NSA is actively listening to everything you do on your laptop, because maybe right now you're not yet important enough. Hey, but you should you know you should have the ambition to be important enough, because you, if you're not a threat to anyone ever in your life, then what have you been doing with your life really? You know, if you're not a serious competitor to an American company, if you are not pressuring American politics at least a little bit some some day in your life, then again, what have you been doing with your life? So a journalist who tells me I have nothing to hide and say, well, yeah, that's the problem. You're apparently not good enough as a journalist to warrant some spying on you, then, then what are you doing with your life, right? Um, so we're gonna need new chips because these are not gonna be good for us because we cannot defend a laptop or a server based on an Intel chipset. And I'd like to have a laptop that I can defend against foreign espionage. And I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm willing to pay for it. I'm willing to pay a lot of money for a laptop that doesn't have this. But right now I can't buy that one. I hope in five years I'll be able to buy one and I'm, I'm willing to put down serious money for it. And so will a lot of large corporations. So, you know, I mean, we all sort of knew this, right? This isn't really, is this really, really news? I mean, isn't it kind of obvious that if, 
if you're a country that runs the company that runs 95% of the world's desktop computers, and if you're in the business of industrial espionage, you'd put a little back door in it. I mean, duh, how obvious is that? So we should have sort of known, but we didn't want to know, but now we know for sure. So now we need to do something about it. So of course, most of us don't have to bother with this kind of crap because we run proper operating systems. Um, if you don't, please start learning. There's people here that can help you. Um, and if you don't get this joke, then you need to rewatch the last 15 minutes of Silence of the Lambs and you'll see how bad it really is. Um, I hear it can be downloaded from the Pirate Bay, so do that. So you don't own your iPhone if you're unlucky enough to have one. Uh, by the way, same goes probably for Android phones. Um, the US Department of Justice alleges that since your law software is licensed, you don't own it. And since you're licensing it, licensing it from an American company, really your phone, legally speaking, is US sovereign territory. And that means that the Patriot Act and its little sisters apply to your phone. No matter if you're not in the US, no matter if you're not a US citizen, no matter if you never go to the US, it doesn't matter. According to the US, it's US sovereign territory and they can do whatever the hell they please with it. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's already been pre-bugged 16 different ways by the NSA by the time you took it out of the shiny box. So this is all really, really quite disconcerting. Now, of course, as they say in Germany, schlimmer ist immer möglich. It can always get worse. So apparently somebody in the US thought it was a good idea to do a full-on military-grade attack against a country they were not at war with and parts of its civilian infrastructure because, of course, we cannot have Iran having civilian nuclear infrastructure, which is completely compliant with international regulations, even though certain other countries in the region have illegal nuclear weapons programs. Um, so, you know, measuring by two standards. So a bunch of people developed the Stuxnet virus to attack the Iranian uh, civilian nuclear infrastructure in Natanz, which was completely legal then and still is. Um, uh, and, of course, that woke up the world to the fact that digitalist warfare against civilian infrastructure without declaring war, that is now a thing that Western countries do. So what do you think all the other countries are going to do? Well, they're going to take the Stuxnet virus, they're going to decompile it, and they're going to have some fun with it. And which are the countries that run most of the Siemens industrial controllers that you can attack with the Stuxnet virus? Well, of course, it's the Western countries. We have automated everything because labor is expensive here. So take your average Western European or North American country, and drop some Stuxnet type viruses in there and things can go badly, badly wrong. Much worse than in Iran or Russia or China. Um, so that wasn't very smart to develop a weapon that is most effective against us and then send it off into the world where everybody can make a copy of it at zero cost. Um, so yeah, there were quite a few countries that were rather unpleased about this fact. So. You would think that after you know messing up the Middle East for about 30 years, we should know by now as the West that dropping weapons in unstable regions of the world is a bad idea. Dropping weapons that you can copy at zero cost is like an exceptionally bad idea. But we did it anyway, we the West again. Um, you know, My country, the Netherlands, is a fully signed up member of the War of Terror and has been for 15 years. Uh, so it's my tax, my tax money at work as well. So. We have all of that going on, and then, of course, we have the, the super-duper special department within um, NSA called Tailored Access Operations, who apparently can violate people's trademarks without being um, afraid of everything because, hey, they're the NSA. And, of course, if you do everything right on your laptop, you keep it offline, you encrypt your hard disk, you have super passwords, you don't leave it lying around your hotel, yeah, there's still ways they can get into that laptop to read your uh, encrypted texts. Um, Thanks to Snowden again and uh, uh, the really good analysis of a lot of people in places like Berlin, of the hacktivist community there, we know a lot of technical details now of the kind of things they do. And some of those things really sound a bit like Star Trek, but they are really, really real, such as the cotton mouth chip, which is the little orangey thing you see in the middle under the USB plug, which is molded inside the USB plug. And if you plug that into your air-gapped computer, it now no longer is an air-gapped computer. Now, how does that chip get into the USB plug that is attached to your scanner? Well, you did the wrong thing. You bought the scanner online using your own credit card and your work address. And then the package got intercepted at 3 in the morning at the post office, and the chip was added to the plug to the scanner. And unless you know what to look for and you happen to have an x-ray machine, you're never going to find it. 
So this is just one of a very large collection of tool set that is actively being deployed in Europe against politicians, companies, individuals, activists, doctors, all kinds of other people. We don't know exactly the scale, but the fact that the CIA has, has a manual with pictures on how to do it tells you that it's not something that happens like twice a year. This is more probably like happening on a daily basis. So don't order sensitive stuff online. Buy with cash and don't bring your phone when you do so, right? Buy your laptop cash in a store. Yup, it all sounds really, really fucking scary, but here we are. These are the facts. And then what are we gonna do about it? So the problem with all this stuff, of course, is the technology always ends up in the hands of everybody eventually, right? So once upon a time, America only had nuclear weapons, and then one more country, and then country three, four, five, six. And of course, by today, probably three dozen countries could build nuclear weapons if they really wanted to, and it'd be pretty hard to stop them. Because we're talking about 1940s technology, how hard can it be? It's just not that difficult in the end. This used to be super secret 25 years ago. Now it's on Wikipedia. And so, again, it goes everywhere. And of course, yes, so the NSA builds weapons and then they lose them. And then other people put them on Mega where you can now download them, right? And yeah, there's more to come. Um, so somebody's gonna have a lot of fun with a bunch of Cisco routers in the next couple of months. And if you're responsible for Cisco routers, ah, you're gonna have some pretty short nights, I predict, in the next half year. Um, so we're putting this stuff in everything because, hey, over-the-air software updates to your car while you're driving because, hey, what could possibly go wrong with that, right? Because it's not like sometimes software updates broke something that never happened. Um, live Ethernet ports in planes because, hey, why not? Because nobody would ever bring, you know, think to bring an Ethernet cable on board in their hand luggage, right? Yeah, that's the same Ethernet network inside the plane that also runs the management of the engines. Because, you know, you want to run one Ethernet cable in the plane because that's lighter than two, so you have one physical network that connects everything from the engine management systems and including the in-flight entertainment system. And then it's virtually separated based on software. I think some people here can sort of see where this goes. Um, yeah, you can have a lot of fun with that, but don't do it because the airline will not be amused at all. So what I think we should be doing is have headlines like these, which, no, it's not real, um, regrettably. Not yet anyway, but you know, give it another year or two. Um, we should have a really broad think about if we want to keep using all this stuff that we like to use. Because if all of it is used to spying on us, and not just you as an individual, but on everybody around you in your society, your politicians, your doctors, your lawyers, the people who work in environmental activist organizations to try to clean up your country. All those people are getting spied against and it's getting abused. And they're all a target and they're all vulnerable because they're all using hardware, software, services that are all designed to spy on them and, you know, sort of in the process also do something quasi useful like word processing. So we need to get rid of all of it. So, oh, there's still a bit of Dutch in there and I apologize for that. Um, so there's two things that everybody needs to do with their IT security. One, upgrade your existing stuff as much as possible. Seriously, you don't have an encrypted hard disk yet. It's 2016 people. Seriously, you know, get your ass off the seat. Be able to encrypt your chats, your, um, uh, your emails, all that kind of stuff. That should be standard now, but it isn't, not in most organizations. But it should be, because the technology is around and people can use it. You can train people how to use it. It's not rocket science. Um, I've written a manual about it, which I'm gonna show, and you can download for free. The other thing is that we need to start working on over time, and this is like a 10-year plan, to completely rebuild a set of tools from the hardware up, operating systems, middleware layers, applications, and then train people how to use those, which completely replaces all the crap that we now know with absolute certainty is not really good for us. It's good for other people, but it's not good for us. It's expensive and it's breaking our democracies and it's destroying our economies and they're stealing from us. And so we should stop buying it and use that money towards replacing it and in the process, you know, create an additional 250 billion euro eco tech economy in Europe, getting a lot of people uh, really cool jobs. So there's like three zones in any future in your IT environment. There's the internets, which is like the wild west. There is no security at all there. I think we all know that. If it's not encrypted, then you know, you're done. 
Then there is your IT environment, which is big and complex and has lots of holes, like web servers and mail servers and all kinds of other crap, and people not using good passwords, and, or they use good password, and then they write them down on little yellow papers, which they leave underneath their keyboard. Um, so you should have a third option, which can be done today, is that inside your organization, you have a zone, which can be a physical place as well as a part of an organization, where people don't use all the, all the unsafe stuff, but they only use the safe stuff. And they've got extra training, and you know, they accept that it's a little less convenient, um, and there you can have security. So this could maybe be part of your R&D department if you're a company, or if you're a company, maybe it's your legal department, or it's the part where you talk about the information that impacts the stock price of a corporation. Or maybe it's the research division of a journalistic enterprise where you want to have some really, really secure systems you, so you can do the really interesting, scary stories where you probably know that your government will be spying on you when you start working on those. Um, so think of it as a citadel. Now, this can be as simple as six or eight people who have some special laptops with proper encryption and who have received some extra training. This is something you can do, and I've helped several media organizations actually setting this up, and we know that it works because they write sensitive stories and not even their own governments can effectively spy on them. So again, thanks to Ed, we know that this works. Encryption works. Of course, often the endpoints are so hopelessly leaky that there's no need to break the encryption. They just hack your laptop, grab your private key, and you know, there goes the effect of your mail encryption. But you can make defensible systems. You just have to do stuff. So if you're an IT person, and you're building systems or maintaining systems, think very carefully, can I protect this? And, and if we are you know, an organization that collects information, can we protect that information? And if we can't, maybe we shouldn't collect it. So you know, if you can't protect it, don't collect it. I think that's a good thing. Now, that's not always gonna be practically possible, and I'm not saying shut down your government today because of it, but maybe you wanna make a plan and work towards a situation where you can protect the stuff. And if that means that some of the existing software vendors need to go, then some of the existing software vendors need to go. Because being in control of our information, that's not a little thing. That touches everything you know, that's worthwhile in our society. So this is gonna be with us for quite a while. Um, I think 10 years to fix this is a very optimistic but doable thing. I think five years from now, we could have secure zones in most organizations. We would still also have completely insecure zones with you know, Microsoft Office legacy and, and all kinds of quasi-cloud dangerous stuff, but we could have that. And then maybe in 10 or 12 or 15 years, it could be the norm that you have a secure computing platform with you know, auditable open, software, uh, open source software only that is checked and that most people understand what it is and can use it and find it normal to not unencrypt email, you know, to not send unencrypted email where, where we consider that rude if you send unencrypted email because now you're destroying your privacy and the privacy of the other person as well. Um, but it's gonna take a little while to get there, um, especially since most, in most organizations we haven't even started yet. And of course we should have started in 2001 when we got the first solid documents about this. So we've basically been messing about for 15 years, and in the intervening time, the Europe spent about a trillion euros, that's a one with 12 zeros, on US software that spies on us. A trillion euros that we could have spent on building software that doesn't spy on us. So that's a bit of a policy fuck up. But now we know we can start fixing it, and that's, of course, what I wanna do. So in 2014, I wrote this uh, book. It's called Information for Journalists, together with Silky Carlo, a London-based uh, journalist and activist, and it's a manual for journalists who are not very technical, and it helps them to learn themselves or with a colleague or a friend in one or two days how to set up a laptop securely against really like high-level threats, how to do things like encrypting files, encrypting emails, having encrypted chats, all that stuff, and to also then teach that stuff to their sources so that they can protect themselves and their sources, which is the really important bit. Um, so it's been downloaded something like a quarter of a million times now, I think, which should be more, but, um, well, there we are. Uh, it's being used in a couple of dozen countries. Um, of course, even if you're not a journalist but just want to have personal privacy, which is your human rights, then, again, use it. The entire book is free on the web. You can download it as an e-book or as a PDF for printing, if that's your thing, and you can also read it on the web while you're setting up your laptop. That's uh, something that people like to do. Um, if somebody wants to take this and make a different version of it for kids, 
if you want to translate it into a language, then you don't need my permission. The whole book is Creative Commons licensed, so just grab it, do something beautiful with it, and let me know, and you know, ask me help if you need, but you don't need my permission. So it's there, do something good with it. So I think IT professionals are mostly underestimating how an important role they could be playing and should be playing in our society. Because most people don't get this yet. But I think some of the people in this room at least technically understand what we can do and what we maybe should be doing um, and what kind of a role we should be playing. And so we all you know, need to pay rent and make some money and yada, 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 that. But the real role is much more bigger than that. It's literally about the kind of countries we're going to be living in. Are we going to be de facto digitally occupied by a bunch of foreign countries? Or are we going to have something that looks like a democracy? Now, democracy isn't all that perfect in Europe, don't get me wrong, but it can be so much worse than what we you know, have today. So um, I'm making it both my work and my hobby to do that, and I'm trying to stitch those um, as closely together as possible. And so a part of my time, and I work for a company where I'm actually allowed to say pretty much all these things in the presence of you know, very senior managers with like suits on and stuff like that. Um, and they haven't fired me yet, so so far so good. Um, so next year there's going to be a little party like this in the Netherlands uh, with um, a slightly higher attendance because we have been doing this for about 25 years in the Netherlands once every four years. So in just under a year from now, um, a short distance from Amsterdam, you're all invited to come. You're also all invited to submit ideas for workshops, talks, projects, villages and all kinds of other stuff. Um, if you want to bring your kids, that's cool. If you want to bring your dog, that's probably also possible. If paying for a plane ticket is difficult, let us know and we'll figure out something for you. Um, there's going to be five or 6,000 people there, a couple of hundred talks, and I hope that some of the talks will be given by some of the people who are here today. And we certainly invite you to do it. And if you want to volunteer in any other role, then of course also you are like super welcome to, um, to join us. So it's online if you just... Um, put this uh, phrase in your uh, favorite search engine, then um, you can find it. There's links to our submission system. We use the same system as, uh, as Balcom uses. Um, I'm sure everybody knows. Um, and all kinds of crazy ideas are welcome. So please uh, join the party and please do so in a very active way as a volunteer or a speaker or a leader of a workshop. So this is uh, the company I work for. This is our sailboat. Um, we use it as a very secure offshore location to have discussions because if you sail away from the coast and you're outside of GSM range and you unplug the little in Marsat thing, then you're like really, really, really offline. And then you can have like a real grown ups conversation about what you really want to do with IT security. Um, it's also just a fun thing to play with. And so I get to play with it every now and then, which is really, really cool. It's like a nice little side benefit. Um, so we know what the technological path is to systems we can trust. We know that free software is a keystone of it. We know that hardware made based on the same principles is a key part of it. All of these things can be done, and most of the things have already been done. We just need to stitch it together into systems that non-techy people can and want to use, and we need to explain to them how important it is, and we need to explain it to our politicians and to the people running companies and hospitals and institutions. And that's one of the jobs that we have. And of course, we need to make sure that it technically works brilliantly and that it's free, both as in euros and most importantly, as in freedom. Um, so I plan to be doing that for the next five to 10 years. Um, and this is one of the companies I'm gonna be doing it for, but I'm also gonna be doing it in my free time. Um, so if the people are interested in this in all kinds of ways, then um, you can contact me if you wanna uh, do stuff here and have me help you talk to some politicians, contact me. Uh, if you want to come to Shah, but don't know how, contact me. Uh, and if you have questions, then there's a mic right there. And I think we have another 20 minutes or so for Q&A. So right now, if people have questions, or if you want to have a question afterward, then I'm here till Sunday exceedingly late. But for the recordings, please, yes, hop to the mic if you have a, if you have a question or a suggestion. Um, but don't do your own speech. If you want to do your own speech, then contact Balcon and they're going to slot you in next year. Thank you.
Hi, I have a question. Uh, what's your opinion on cyber insurance that European Union needs to implement as mandatory for every company in 2017? Cyber, Cy cyber insurance. Insurance. Yeah. As in, as in, with an insurance company, you mean? Yeah, insurance companies are developing cyber insurance. Yes, yes, I know. I, I think I understand that for the insurance companies it can be a profitable business. Although I think that some of them are underestimating the amount of money that they might have to pay out. The problem I see with it is that an activity that an organization should be doing, you know, making their IT secure so that the human right to privacy of the people that they work for doesn't get damaged is now something you can buy off. So I'm, I'm a little bit afraid of where that could end up going. So I think if, um, if a company messes up and leaks the private information of people because they've messed up, I think we should make the fine so high that it becomes very difficult to insure. And then eventually we make the fine so high that it's just cheaper to just fix it because that's what we want. So we don't want IT insecurity to become a profit center for financial services companies. What we want is to, to, the problem to be fixed, right? Because, it's, because it's, it's the information of real human beings like you and me, including their personal private information when they talk to their doctor or problems they have with their families that ends up being open on the internet. And I, I'm, I'm not sure if violating somebody's human rights to privacy should be something that you can just buy off with Swiss Ray. So I understand the business, but I think we should just keep upping the fines until the insurance companies say, ah, we're not gonna do this anymore. Because then people will be forced to fix it. So that's, I think, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I have another question. You've uh, shown a slide with uh, vendors that have a backdoor that are mm -hmm. contract partners yeah. with NSC. Uh, there's a Finnish company called Jola. I have you heard about that? Uh, they have that uh, selfish uh, operating system for mobile devices, which mm -hmm. can be installed on Android yeah. over the pre installed devices. Do you think that uh, they have this partnership with NSA? Because it's, it's, it's a it's, community based. Yeah, it's very, it's very hard to know for sure. Because one of the conditions on having a relationship with the NSA is that you cannot talk about your relationship with the NSA. Um, and if you do, you could end up in jail for a very long time. And, and this is really, really serious. So part of when, especially when you're an American company, when you get a national security letter that instructs you to now surrender control of your technology to the NSA, the letter very clearly states, if you talk about this to anyone ever, we will throw the full legal book of anti-terror law at you and your company, which basically means that you're gonna be screwed for life and everybody who works with you. So it's very hard to know for sure if somebody complies with that or not. I remember Linus Torvalds was once asked this, this question about the Linux kernel, if he had ever been approached by the NSA to put a backdoor in the Linux kernel. Um, and so he knew he was being recorded. Uh, so he said, no. That's what he did. And so, um, but of course, lots of other people can look at the code of the Linux kernel. So we have a, at least a sporting chance of detecting any you know, nasty stuff that somebody wants to put in there. So I'm, so I'm, I'm not so naive as to say if we make everything open source, all our problems go away. But I do think it's a, it's a precondition to even having a fighting chance. In the same way that being a democracy doesn't make all your problems go away. But if you're not a democracy, you're already completely screwed, right? And there's no way to fix it. So, so free software is not the solution to everything, but it's part of the critical condition to being able to fix something. So, so that's why I think it's important. Thank you. Sure. You've discussed um, how Europe should do something about um, American spying. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess, this is making me hopeful that something is starting to happen. Um, but I'm curious, uh, in other countries, including America, um, but not just including America, mm -hmm. like all the other continents, what uh, people are thinking about this? Well, well, so I know for a fact that in many Asian countries, uh, India, oh, China, of course, um, Russia, uh, and most Latin American countries, this is already a very normal way to talk about things. Now, that doesn't mean that they're already technologically there, but at least in the thinking of the people who are doing the long-term planning, this is a fairly normal way to, to, to discuss matters. So, so in Europe, we're still, especially in Western Europe, of course, we're still very much like US fanboys. I think here it's a, hopefully a little less for very good reasons, by the way. 
Um, uh, but but certainly in Western Europe, we still, you know, oh, Obama, and he's so nice, and you know, blah, 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 blah. And of course, he kills 12 children with drones on a daily basis, but somehow he's a nice guy because he did something for US healthcare. I, I don't know how that mentally works with people, but apparently that works. I'm still hoping that at some point, the US population will be fed up with um, what's being done to them, but I don't see it happening, regrettably, which is sad um, and worrying. But I'm also like, okay, sorry, I'm, I'm going to be worried about like the 500 million people that I live close to first, and let's see if we can fix that. And, you know, then maybe we can help the people in the colonies fix their problems eventually. Um, but, but right now, that's like, it's lower on my personal priority list. Um, so, 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 so that's why. But, but I'm hoping at some point, you know, and then maybe after they elect Trump, um, somebody will wake up to how badly that crap is. Uh, certainly after they elect Hillary, um, people will, because that's even worse in my view, but you know, that's a personal opinion. Um, so I'm still hoping that somebody will wake up there to just how bad things are, the fact that you're in one of the richest industrialist countries in the world and your bridges are falling into the rivers. You know, what's up with that? And your children can't get health care. What's up with that? Um, but yeah, I've yet, to, I've yet to see it. So maybe somebody will wake up. It would be cool. Um, but yeah, for me, it's like my neighbors first. All right. Uh, just hand the mic. Just don't hog it. Hi. Uh, you mentioned about, uh, problems about chips being backdoored. Okay, we can all encrypt hard drives, files, you know, like use open source software. But the problem with the chips is it requires a lot of money. You know, so can you can you give us a little more information about what's being done about it? So, um, so there's no reason why you could not develop alternative chips, including chip. Man I mean, we have microchip manufacturing capability in Europe. It's not, you know, we're usually with that not competing head to head with Intel because nobody dares to, and because you couldn't do it, you know, in a profitable way since there is no market demands for something like an Intel chip that is worse than an Intel chip, but that doesn't have a back door. And so I think now with the kind of conversation I'm having and lots of other people are having about the need for secure system, we're trying to create a market for something that is like a, a general CPU that might not be as good as the latest Intel chip in terms of price performance and power consumption versus performance, but that has the massive advantage of not being backdoored. And so my, maybe people are willing to pay a premium for having a not backdoor chip and then we could just make those. And the European Space Agency made some pretty good designs in the 90s uh, on risk chipsets that you can put into an FPGA, for instance, and those designs are completely publicly auditable because they were paid for with the tax money of Europeans, so designs are open, and we all own them together, so anybody can just grab that and run with it. So I'm not saying that that's a solution, but maybe it's a starting point. Um, and so the hardware part is probably being the more difficult part of this total equation, because actually the software stack, we already have the software stack. We just need to explain people to use it. So this is more than educational. Uh, thing and, and a government policy thing, right? Stop standardizing your entire educational system on Microsoft products. That sounds like a nice idea, for instance. Um, the hardware stuff is actually difficult and expensive. But if we don't have secure hardware, none of the arrest makes sense. So we have to do both, and we have to do it within a few years. But there is a viable technological path of doing it. We just have to get enough sort of demand for it. And, and the crazy thing is that probably economically the answer is going to be a bunch of very large corporations to say, okay, we are willing to drop some significant money on fixing this for ourselves, and then, oh, if we already fixed it, we might as well sell it to everybody else at some sort of quasi-reasonable price. And, and I'd be happy to pay five times what I'm paying now for my CPU if it doesn't come with a back door. Right? So, so I think there's an answer out there, but it's going to take us a couple of years to, to fix it. But there's also a business opportunity for the companies to do it. So th there is money to be made here to, to fix a big political social problem. So I'm hoping that you know, somebody will pick that up. I'm not a hardware expect, uh, expert myself, but somebody out there is going to do this. And somebody is going to be working at that company and having a great time and having also a nice job. So I, I think there's a path there. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm going to do the roving mic thing now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, for, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your lecture today. Uh, I had a chance to listen to you uh, at Russia today. 
Oh, it, right, yes. Yeah, it, was, it was a similar subject, and uh, this is something I'm very interested in as I'm working in a company that deals with uh, very sensitive user information. Um, first, I would like to uh, I would like to ask two questions. First of all, uh, would be something that I'm maybe personally interested in. There was all the fuss recently about um, uh, Apple not being able to unlock uh, an iPhone uh, for the FBI, and then yeah, you should never believe anything the FBI tells you, right? Yes, and that that, that, that was like like a huge huge PR, right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, I I think I think. The Apple PR department did absolutely brilliant on that, and it doesn't may really make a difference. It is quite possible, actually, that the FBI cannot open an Apple because the NSA refuses to give the FBI their tools, because the NSA knows that the FBI is getting hacked weekly by the Chinese, because they just can't secure the systems. They're even worse than the NSA on that. And of course, the NSA is the organization that lost a million and a half top secret documents to an external contractor who's a high school dropout, and they don't know which ones to this day. So that tells you about the quality of their internal controls, which are less than perfect, shall we say. And thanks, and uh, the other question would be, uh, there was a previously a question regarding um, insurance, but as I know, uh, EU has a directive that will uh, become valid on 2018. Yeah. Um, that will like uh, ensure liability of companies that deal with sensitive user data. Yeah. So if my company loses or something gets, I don't know, mishandled with, yeah. the, with yeah. the user data, my company will be held liable. Yeah. So do you think that will really change something or? Yes, I do think um, in the Netherlands uh, where I'm working with this, the fine is now, uh, is now 900,000 euros per case. Um, and in Europe, a fine can be up to 4% um, of your global pre-tax revenue as a company, with a maximum of, I think, 20 million euros per case, where it's actually the oversight body determines what a case is. So if you five times lose the data of 1,000 people, is that five cases or 5,000 cases? Yeah, that, that's yet to be determined by the, by the lawyers. Um, my personal view is that if you can ensure away this risk, then the fines aren't high enough, right? So with, for instance, um, abusing a monopoly position in the EU, um, Microsoft was fined 1.8 billion euros. And that probably was too low a fine given how much money they made off the monopoly. Um, so I think we should make the fines so painful and so high that most companies simply will not dare to take the risk and will invest significant efforts in employing smart people and in fixing their tech to make sure that the risk is like really, really exceedingly low instead of something that happens every week in some European country. So again, um, it may very well be that a 20 million euro fine for a multinational corporation is simply too low amount of money. We'll see. Um, but already the fact that now it costs 20 million to screw up instead of almost nothing is already getting a lot of companies very interested in this sort of stuff. So, so if you compare the kind of questions that are being asked now, also in the commercial space, about this sort of stuff versus two years ago, it's a completely different universe. So even you know, the 900,000 euro fine or the 20 million fine, which for a large corporation is chicken feed, that's already helping. But maybe it needs a little bit more and, and maybe we need to have a few spectacular scandals to make that clear to politicians. And it's quite possible. So I'm always hoping that we're gonna have a data leak involving some very famous artists or members of some royal family or stuff like that. Because then that's really, you know, will get everybody's blood pumping. So so here's, I'm, I'm not saying go hack the royal family, please don't, you'll be in jail, don't do that. But should it happen, it might not be the worst thing, policy-wise. Thank you. Sure. Anyone else? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, if there are no more questions for now, um, if you want to talk to me offline, um, there's email and chat, and I'm going to be here physically until Sunday exceedingly late. So, talk to me. Thank you all very much for being here and your attention, and I hope to see all of you next year in the Netherlands at, uh, at our party at Shah. Um, it's going to be beautiful weather, and there's water and a harbor and cool stuff. Um, and you come. Right? Okay, thank you.